Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, the host of the podcast. Hunter's with me today. Hunter, thanks for joining me. Autumn, it's great to be here, and I should probably point out to our listeners as we start this conversation, I have been hitting hard the leftover Easter jelly beans in the <laughs> from the kids' department in the office, and I am like getting ready to have a, I'm hopped up on sugar, and I'm getting ready to crash hard, and so that's probably going to affect my coherence in this episode. Hopefully, you can do something with this. Well, we'll see how it goes. Okay. <laughs> We're going to roll with it. <laughs> um, we are picking up a conversation that we've had over the course of the last three episodes on politics. So a few weeks ago, we talked about the purpose of politics and the purpose of government and then trends in American politics. And throughout those episodes, I invited our listeners to send in questions. Thank you to those of you who thought about this and sent in some questions. Absolutely. Today, we are responding to a few listener questions on the topics topic of politics. So that is where we're going to jump in. Is there anything you want us to bear in mind from our prior conversation center, or should we just roll forward with the first question? Let's just roll with the questions. I'm sure we'll call back to some things we've discussed, but uh, I'm, I'm eager to hear what our listeners are going to hit us with. All right. Well, before you have that sugar crash, let's <laughs> get going. Right. I'm, I, I'm a ticking clock here, so <laughs> let's go. All right. Well, the first question is really two different questions, but submitted by two different listeners. They're on the same theme, though. So we're going to read one, then the other, and then respond to both together. Both are on the topic of Christian nationalism. So the first is this. I've heard about Christian nationalism off and on for years. According to the article from NPR Politics, which I'm attaching, Christian nationalists are becoming more mainstream. Michael Johnson, the new Speaker of the House, is a Christian nationalist. And the article to which this listener is referring also mentions that, mentions Michael Johnson. So my question is this, says the listener, although they have Christian, quote unquote, in their name and hold to some values I might agree with, are they, that is Christian nationalists, Christian in a biblical sense? They seem to support some things and use tactics that are in opposition to the Bible and what Jesus would teach. So that's the first question. And then the second on the same topic is this. Where did this idea of Christian nationalism come from? And do other countries struggle with this concept? Or is this unique to America? Okay, there is a lot of talk right now about Christian nationalism. I've heard it uh, quite a bit and have read quite a bit about it, although sometimes I'm, I'm not quite sure what people mean by Christian nationalism. And I also have observed that this conversation has really come about primarily since 2020. I've, I've heard more and more about it. This term certainly predates 2020, but I, it seems to be a, a more contentious conversation in our cultural and media landscape in the last four or five years. Uh, so I think it's actually helpful to think about why that is and, and, and where it came from. Like, why is everyone talking about this right now, besides the fact that everyone's talking about because everyone's talking about it? Like, what <laughs> what's what are the undercurrents that are driving that conversation? And as I step back and look at that, there's two undercurrents I see that I think are driving all this. The first one is the progression of secularity to a place of denying or inverting creation order. And I, I said that really carefully, the progression of secularity. A secular country or a secular society just means there's no official or established uh, religion to it. And the public square is open to all, regardless of religious beliefs or convictions. That's what secular means. When I say a progression of secularity, I mean that the, the public square in America has become more and more and more a place where it seems like the majority opinion, or maybe it's just the more powerful and the more influential opinion, are opinions that are, I think, uh, subverting what I'm calling here creation order in a way that that wasn't true in American public life previously. And and I'm thinking here in particular about uh, our understanding of sexuality, of gender, of justice. The, these are 
things that we've talked about previously, marriage, these are things we've talked about previously on, on the podcast. But I do think anytime there is a powerful movement within a culture that works against just the natural order that God has woven into creation, that's politically destabilizing to a country or a culture, especially a culture that has previously lived pretty consistently with with that creation order. So I think that's one thing that's been happening for quite a long time in in the U.S., but seems to have become more intense in in even just the last five, six years. So that's probably one undercurrent. And I think the second undercurrent is many Christians or people of a more conservative bent are trying to understand that shift and respond to it. And, quote, Christian nationalism is a term some have used to say, well, this if this is the direction our culture is going to go, we need uh, to be more vocal about Christian nationalism and advocate for Christian nationalism. And then these two undercurrents like work against each other. So uh, the cult, the the culture or powers in the culture become more aggressively or progressively secular in this way that I'm describing. And then Christians respond, or some Christians respond, not all Christians, but some respond, well, we need Christian nationalism. And then that just evokes fear on the other side. And they're like, oh, see, everyone wants Christian nationalism. That would be so bad. And it's just, these are kind of these reinforcing poles that that seem to be happening. I, I think that's where the debate is coming from uh, in in our culture. And it's just helpful to understand that and see that that's what's driving it. Mm. So in a sense, this these ideas aren't entirely new. There is a certain novelty to some of the secular ideas that are being promoted that you just described. But in a sense, just the idea itself of Christian nationalism isn't new. There's a way that it's been present in the public conversation that's reinforced by this dynamic that you're describing. And different people are using the term in different ways. Mm -hmm. And and maybe we can talk about a couple of those different ways it's being being used. But it's not even always clear what the term means. I've even heard some politicians say, well, our country needs to be a Christian nationalist country. I think Marjorie Taylor Greene, the the firebrand representative from Georgia famously said that, you know, and it's not clear what she means, except that, she, you know, she's not putting together a coherent policy proposal that we could look at and go, well, that's what she means. But it's a way of playing on the anxiety of people who feel like our our culture is moving away from or subverting creation order and and. So there, there's some ways this term just gets thrown around that plays to some people's anxieties. It expresses a frustration that some have and, and a concern they have, and, and it's kind of the label they want to put on what, what we should do about those concerns. So one of the difficulties, and our listeners, I think, are alluding to this in, in the questions, is it's sometimes hard to know what is meant by this by this term. Like, how mm-hmm. is this different than just Christians advocating for things that are consistent with a Christian worldview in the public square? Why is it suddenly now branded Christian nationalism? Is there something new that's happening, or is it just a label that's being used? That's such a good point to make. And the person who submitted this question is actually <laughs> pointing this out as well. I don't quite know what is meant by Christian nationalism. Oh. Uh, there's, an, there's an article that you pointed me to, Hunter, and the the author of the article, Andrew T. Walker, he captures this well. He says, so much of its usage, that is the term, he's talking about the term Christian nationalism, depends on the person wielding it. Some take the term to mean that America is in a unique national covenant with God. That I squarely reject. Some use the term to describe the government taking active steps to promote a Christian culture. I'm not sure what that means, and perhaps there are varying degrees to which that is possible without important lines getting crossed. Christmas is, after all, a federal holiday. Of late, I've seen critics on Twitter and the media intimate that if one wants American law to ban same-sex marriage, ban abortion, ban transgender transgender medicine, repeal no-fault divorce, or promote the natural family, then 
well, that's Christian nationalism. If so, I'm guilty as charged. And then he asks, where does that leave me? (laughs) I think I have that sense in this question and in this conversation as well. (laughs) Yes. In fact, the NPR article that that one of our listeners referenced that was describing Mike Johnson, the the, uh, Speaker of the House, as a Christian nationalist, I I have a sense they were using that because of uh, the the quote you just read, his third definition of Christian nationalism, which is just that, um, you know, some some want uh, Americans to have laws that would like ban abortion, ban transgender medicine, you know, repeal no fault divorce. He might have opinions about justice and, and beliefs about justice and law and how it should be translated to law that would be consistent with his Christian worldview. And so they're just labeling that Christian nationalist. I I do think there is a, a sense in which the label is being used sometimes to just by, by the what I'm calling the progressively secular who are really about denying creation order. I think there are times when it's being used by them in order to just kind of scare people away from those who would who would uh, be arguing for something that they don't like and and I wouldn't put that past NPR I I like NPR I listen to NPR but NPR definitely uh comes from a a secular a progressively secular editorial bent and so I don't I don't rely on NPR to to accurately represent Christians or even sometimes to represent those who disagree with them in in the best light and and so I think that's maybe happening in that case where they're where they're calling him a Christian nationalist. Mm-hmm. It, it could be helpful to try to define the term a, l- a little bit more. And as I thought about this, I thought, you know, there's really two definitions that I, I think I hear people arguing for, and these definitions are different. Um, one definition I call the establishment definition, and that is like Christianity should be the officially established religion of a country. It would and and the church and the state should have like an officially established relationship. So this understanding of Christian nationalist wants to go back to a Christendom era political arrangement where the church and the state had a uh, an official relationship and there was an official state church. So that that's one definition of Christian nationalist. Now, we obviously know America does not have, constitutionally, we don't have an established religion. And so I don't hear many Americans saying, well, we need to just establish a religion because things have gotten so bad. I I think there's kind of an an Americanized version of Christian nationalism that I would call, if if the first one is the established definition, I might call the second one the privileged definition. And they're arguing that we need to... um, return to where Christianity is is the privileged religion in the public square. They would hope that our government would promote policies that are that privilege the Christian worldview, give it a place of preeminence in their policy making, such that more of our government policies would be consistent with justice as the Bible would define it. So they're not asking for a, a state church, and they're not asking for the, quote, establishment of religion, but they would ask that the worldview of Christianity be privileged. You could also argue that that was true historically in some uh, times in, in, in American history. If you think about our founding, our it does not appear that most of our founders were Orthodox, Bible-believing Christians. A, f- a few were, but but that certainly was the majority. And yet there was the way they would define justice, the way they would define righteousness, the way uh, they would define what kind of would and wouldn't be accepted publicly. Our, they even would say virtue was ne- is necessary for a free people. And the way they would define virtue would be consistent with a Christian worldview, even if it wasn't drawn directly from it or it, was, it wasn't always chaptered and versed from the Bible. The, the way they would just define virtue would be consistent with the Christian worldview. So I do think there was a, a way historically that 
Christianity played a more prominent, you could even say a more privileged role in American public life. And it came because most people believe things that were consistent with the, with the Christian worldview. And that's less and less and less true today. So the, the question becomes like, how do you get back to that? <laughs> and, and, and the only way you get back to that is by people becoming convinced again. And, and so that puts the onus of persuasion on us. I hear many Christians who are just simply advocating for definitions of virtue and justice in the public square that are consistent with our Christian worldview. And I, I think that's just Christians doing what Christians should do. I don't think that's Christian nationalism. <laughs> and, and I think it's just Christians trying to be persuasive. Mm, that's helpful to, well, it's helpful, first of all, to give this some definition. We've acknowledged that the term itself is pretty convoluted and used in many different ways. And so th thanks for giving us some definition, Hunter. And it's helpful to think of it in those two categories, the establishment definition, where there's a would be a formal relationship between church and state, and the privileged definition, which you're saying is more common in America and the way people are arguing for it. Um, so I have a few questions, though. Listening to your definitions raises a few questions for me. And the first is this. Is Christian nationalism an issue that's particular to Protestantism or evangelicalism probably is a better way to say it within our American context? Or does this perspective, the Christian nationalist perspective, in some way exist in other mainline denominations as well, because I think in the media representation of it, I hear it most often presented as a an issue in evangelical spaces and churches. Yeah, and I think the the first thing I'm saying is I think actual Christian nationalism doesn't exist in a lot of spaces, even within evangelicalism. I think it's just Christians advocating for public policy that is based on biblical understanding of virtue and justice, and that is not. Christian nationalism properly defined. And and so I think there's more using of this label than there is actuality of Christian nationalism happening. Now, Christians advocating for issues of justice and, mor and morality and virtue that are consistent with a Christian worldview, is that particular to evangelicalism or is it in other denominations? It's, it's not particular to evangelicalism. And in fact, the the Catholic Church has a, a long history of advocating for public policy that is consistent with their Catholic understanding uh, of, of what is good and, and what is just. They also have a—there's a category that is used more frequently within Catholicism. I, I said that very carefully. I don't think it's a category that is particular to or unique to Catholicism. I think it's actually a— a biblical category, but I think there's been historically. I, I know there's been a bigger emphasis in the last six, seven hundred years within Catholicism than I think has been in Protestantism on this category, and it's the category of natural law. The natural law is the law God made, the way God made us and the world to work. That's woven into the fabric of creation. It. It's not different than his moral law that's in Scripture, but rather the natural law acknowledges we can discover what God's law is by simply looking at the way he made the world to make, to, to work. A, just a very simple definition would be like, or an example would be like, male and female are obviously sexually compatible. Look, <laughs> look how God made them. It's kind of evident from the way he, he made them. And I, I think there's biblical justification for that. Paul uses the word natural, and he uses the term unnatural to describe the sexual relationship between man and woman. He says that's natural, and he says um, same-sex sexual relationships are unnatural, and he's referring to the way God made nature to work and what's evident to all in nature. And uh, Catholicism has a, a history of, of appealing to natural law, meaning when we're in public debate or conversation with our neighbors who may or may not agree that the Bible is authoritative, we can still appeal to the way nature works and what it shows us and what it reveals to find some common ground to, to work together. And, and I, I think that's a good category for us to have in mind as we seek to 
persuade and 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 appeal in the public square that that we we all, we can we can appeal to the Bible and we can and we can be informed by the Bible and it's good to quote the Bible but but it may be also persuasive to be able to appeal to what's evident in nature. That's not going to be persuasive to all. Like like I said at the outset, I think there's a whole secular trend that is anti-natural and 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 it, it's it's a, a subversion of creation order. And so it's going to be hard to win them by appealing to nature because the very their very project is about is about going against nature. Um, but I think there can still be some common ground established with many by by appealing to that. So to my question, you're saying there are streams within Catholicism and evangelicalism that promote this idea of natural law that is actually in accordance with God's created order. And if that is being labeled Christian nationalism, well, then it's simply not. (laughs) That's maybe a label given broadly or ambiguously by the media or by someone who would hold to a more progressively secular in the way that you defined it earlier perspective mm-hmm. would say. So are, are you telling me then in answer to my question that this idea of Christian nationalism, even in its narrower sense, is just a non-issue in evangelicalism or in Christianity in America? No, I, I'm not saying it's a non-issue, but I am saying it's not always an issue everywhere in the way that that some are suggesting. There are definitely streams of American evangelicalism who have conflated the promises that God made to Israel with and with America and have basically taken the promises God made to Israel and applied them to America as if we are a chosen people with a promised land. And and so so that's not accurate. And and where that pops up we need to we need to dismiss that. And, and I think in the last four or five years, we've seen ch- examples of churches that, that I think have gone places politically that churches shouldn't go. I, I can think there's a large, uh, there's a large, large Baptist church, First Baptist Church in downtown Dallas that had um, right, like right next door to where I used to work. And they, in the, they had like Trump rallies in, in their church. And where they would sing songs about "Make America Great Again," their choir would sing "Make America Great Again," and they would fly the flag, and Trump would come and speak. And I, man, that's that's weird, right? That's that's not Christianity. That's not a rep. That's not an accurate representation of Christianity. So where that happens, we do need to be able to look at that and say that's that's weird. And I I recently um, have read parts of a book by Tim Alberta, a journalist called The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, and he's documenting some of these examples. Like, the First Baptist one is actually an example he documents, and he spent some time interviewing the pastor there and to kind of get his perspective, and I think did a good job of documenting what's happening there and, and why. And and he he gives several examples of these pretty, ex, I, I would say, pretty extreme things happening in different churches. The The thought that I kept having running through my mind as I, as I was reading his book and reading his examples is if you just read this book, you'll think that this is, this is what is, this is the thing that's happening. This is, this is American Christianity, or this is, this is what evangelicals are doing because you, all you have to do is do what he does, pile up about 15, 20 examples that are pretty grotesque. And then it's like, look at what a big problem this is. And yet if I step back and go, who do I know most evangelical Christians to be? This is not, they're not accurately represented by these extreme examples in Tim Alberta's book. And, and I think there is a, a real tendency among our media class to take those extreme examples and then um, use those extreme examples to say, well, this is what Christianity has become in America in, in a way that's way too broad brush. And so, yes, this, this is a problem at times, and where it is a problem, we need to be able to say that's a problem there. And yet we need to be careful that we don't take that narrative and just put it on all Christians who might just just be trying to advocate for a definition of justice that they see as consistent with the way God made the world to work. 
Great. You set up my next question, Hunter, perfectly. Um, I said this was a QR and r episode for our listeners, but really, I'm just excited to continue <laughs> to ask you questions. Oh, great. <laughs> no, but... Uh, I, I'm going to need some more jelly beans. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder then, I think a good way to succinctly state this in a question is, is Christian nationalism compatible with Christianity? Mm. Is it furthermore commanded in any way in mm. the f- form in which we talked about it as establishment? I, I don't see evidence for that in scripture, but in the definition that you offered of the privileged definition is that kind of understanding of christian nationalism compatible with and or commanded by Uh scripture well i like those two terms you're using compatible and commanded because those are different a something is compatible if it it is different than but it can go alongside and something is commanded if like the bible requires that of us so is Christianity being privileged or established as a religion? Is that compatible with what the Bible calls the church to do, which is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you? Is, is it compatible with the disciple-making mission of the church? And I would say in some cases it can be compatible I think we see some compatibilist examples historically. Uh, Christendom, which arose in the aftermath of the Roman Empire and in Western Europe, Christendom, where most countries had an established religion, I think you could say the work of the church carried on in many of those societies and the work of the government informed by Christian principles and having even a re- established relationship with the church also carried on. There were benefits to that and drawbacks to that. So it wasn't, it wasn't by, by any means, was it, was it perfect? No, but was it compatible? Well, in some sense, yes. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of the Protestant Reformation uh, began in Germany and the relationship between the the church and the st- and the state in Protestant Germany was was a very much a compatible relationship, and within that political order, the the gospel advanced. This wonderful gospel renewal movement happened and, and began, called the Reformation. So I think God's work continued on there. So yes, it can be compatible. Is it commanded to Christians that we go and establish Christianity as the official religion of the societies in which we live? No, that's that's not commanded of us. Now, so, some there are some who are advocating for Christian nationalism in a in a, a more establishment kind of form who would probably debate me on that and would say no, that we are commanded to do that, but. I don't see that commanded in Scripture. I see what what is commanded of us in Scripture is the Great Commission, and I see the Great Commission working itself out in all kinds of cultures under all kinds of political arrangements, and I think Christians can live and work in all kinds of cultures and political arrangements, and it has different consequences. The political arrangement has different consequences for them, but, but let's just take the American culture that we live in. If There was a time in history when Christianity played a privileged or a predominant role in public life, and and justice and virtue were defined in a way that was consistent with Christianity, and that's less and less and less so today. Can the church, can the church's mission still succeed in that culture? Absolutely. The church's mission can still go forward. It might put pressures on us that we didn't have to face then. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be obedient to Jesus, and if the government punishes me for being obedient to Jesus, then I'm going to take it, and that'll be the consequences of obedience to Jesus. But but that doesn't keep the mission of the church from moving forward. Would it be better for our culture and the public life if the understandings of justice and virtue that are that are informed by Christianity was the prevailing opinion? And absolutely, that'd be much better. So then should I advocate for that in the public square as a Christian? I, I think I, sh- I think I should. And to the, to the place that, to the, in the ways that God has given me 
to advocate, I should, I should advocate. But, but here's where I'm just a little bit reluctant. Should I then change the mission of the church in, in light of where the culture has gone? Should I reorient the mission of the church toward cultural, uh, winning back cultural capital? And I want to be careful that we don't reorient the mission of the church back toward political persuasion when what we need to be doing as a church is evangelism and discipleship. And, and so this is, this is the place I, I want us, I want us to, to live. Just because the culture change, changes doesn't mean the mission of the church needs to shift. We need to keep doing our, our mission. Mm-hmm. This leads us directly into our next listener question, Hunter. And the question is this, what does obedience look like for a Christian in the political domain? You've used the term public square. And then part two of that same question is how broadly or to what degree should a church or its members seek to influence the state? I think the first thing a Christian needs to do is to resolve in their heart and mind. And if you're married, resolve this in your marriage (laughs) and, and resolve it in your family. Our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus Christ and to his word. Resolve that. And we are not going to do anything that would be disobedience to Jesus or would subvert his authority just in our lives. So that's the, that's the first place to, to go. That will help you to ferret out when you're, when you're in public life what you can and can't participate in. It doesn't answer cleanly every single question that's going to come up, but it, but it does answer a lot of the big ones. And, and that is a political act to say, I'm going to be in the public square, but I'm going to be in the public square in a, in a way that distinctly honors the lordship of Jesus and doesn't dishonor the lordship of Jesus is, is a hugely political act. So, so start there. If I was a Christian parent, then that to me would mean I am not going to, um, allow my kids to be, um, taught things that, that contradict the Christian worldview or when they encounter them, I am going to make sure that I, as a parent, am able to, uh, to, to walk with them through that and, and teach them what God's Word actually says. And I'm going to teach them in the process how we honor the Lord and His Word, not other ideologies as, as Lord. So I'm just going to, I'm going to make sure my kids are discipled into you know, fo- following Jesus, knowing they're going to encounter um, Ideas that doesn't mean I'm going to protect them from every idea that would would counter the lordship of Jesus. Uh, that there's there's judgment calls the parents have to make in terms of how much they can and cannot expose their their kids to. But I I want to teach them to to honor the Lord and and I'm going to make sure that I don't subtly suggest that uh, the ideas that are that undermine the authority of God and His Word are are allowed to just um, go unchecked in in their in their hearts and minds. So I think that's the first political act. Beyond that, we we all have things like we have to vote. So I think we have to make a Christian conscience informed decision about how to vote. And then we all have political spheres in which God has given us involvement. And and that looks different for different people. And and so it's hard to be overly prescriptive beyond that because I don't think everyone has to get involved in advocacy work on perhaps or on on um, particular issues. You have to discern what God has called you to based on the circumstances He's put you in, the gifts He's given you, uh, the the experiences He's given you. That's probably going to inform some of your political life beyond just the normal work of being a citizen and voting and, 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 and participating in public spaces. I would add Hunter, something that we've brought up in a past week on this series in these episodes on politics. And that is being a part of a local church. You explained in a prior episode that the church is established as a redeemed politic and is a, 
supposed to be a redemptive picture of what it looks like to love each other, to abide by these one another's. And that in and of itself, being part of a healthy local church that is evangelizing and participating in discipleship, discipling people, is a political act. And to the extent that we, as a local church, disciple people in a way that is consistent with scripture, we will within any culture. So in our culture also find ways that cultural norms and ideas run counter to what scripture says. And when that happens, we will abide by and uphold what scripture says and seek to obey God. So I would add that to what you said a moment ago, but this leads me into another Another question for me, <laughs> my own question, but it's attached to our listener question. The listener asks, how broadly should a church or its members seek to influence the state? Mm-hmm. I think it's imagining a particular sort of political stance or action. And you also mentioned the book by Tim Alberta a few months ago and the examples in that are captured in that book. When I think of those examples at fellowship, you haven't led that way as a pastor. So what I'm asking for in this question is your pastoral perspective. We haven't chosen to make that sort of political stance a part of our regular gatherings. So our pastors don't directly address culture war issues in sermons in in that way. We don't host Sunday services like the ones you mentioned that are oriented around a particular political issue in a way that's intended to make an obvious stand to our community. Um, so as a pastor, why have you chosen this mm. m- way for our church or this modality, this way of leadership and this method of leading our congregation? Yeah, I, I get that question from time to time. And often I'll push a little bit back and say, well, we talk about political issues and culture war, quote, issues all the time. We talk about them in the course of teaching scripture, and and there are all kinds of things of cultural controversy that come up in the course of teaching through the Bible. Uh, I'm thinking about the sermon I'm preparing for next week as we record this podcast. I'm not sure if it'll it won't be next week when this comes out. It'll probably already have happened, but I'm I've got a sermon on on the Christian uh, teaching of sexual on sexuality, and that is a political issue, and that is a culture war issue. So. Um, we are going to, we do talk about that. We, we have, we talk about justice. We talk about abortion. We've taught on abortion in forums. We've, we, I've, re- I referenced it in sermons. So I think though, when people are asking me that question, they, they are imagining that, that maybe the church should do something different than what I'm describing, like just teaching about these issues when they come up in the Bible, but rather, they're imagining that we should um, ad- address like l- legislation that's happening, or we should address, um, we should take time and just address the the particular issues that are being debated. And I, I can see some reason why churches do that and and would do that, and and we may have to we may do that um, from time to time. In general, I would step back and say, I'm not sure that the local church's role, however, should be organizing and activating the membership of the church for, quote, political action. And to give an example, I'm thinking about, I've gone to churches before that, leading up to election, especially presidential elections, they're going to distribute a voter guide to everybody on the way in, and it's going to basically tell us how we should vote in, in, in all the races. And then we're going to—the sermon's going to be about voting, and how. And really it's going to, it's going to tell you, sometimes explicitly, how you should vote. And so in that sense, the, the church has decided, hey, we're going to take this Sunday morning, and we're going to activate all of our members to, do, to, to vote in a particular way. That, that's our job. I just don't think that's the mission of the church. And and so I think that that in, in some ways um, violates a couple of other principles I see in, in Scripture. One principle I see is of Christian conscience. 
and pastors in particular are instructed to bind people's consciences on things that are explicit in Scripture about this is what is and isn't Christianity. And and then we are permitted to offer opinions, but we and, and to say, here's my perspective, but we are not permitted to bind people to our opinions in a way that we would say, and if you don't agree with me and do what I'm telling you to do on this, you're being disobedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, so you see Paul doing this from time to time. Paul will say, hey, I'll give you my opinion as one who is wise, but if you do something else, you haven't sinned. And and I I think we need to have that category. What happens if a pastor over-opinionates on things and, and doesn't give people some space to make up their minds? And I say space because space can be like an emotional thing. Like, do I feel like do I feel like this pastor is inviting, helping me to make up my own mind, or is this pastor just telling me what I have to do or not do in order to be a faithful Christian? When a pastor doesn't do that, when he, when he overly binds consciences, then the message that is subtly or not so subtly received is, if I don't do this, I'm being disobedient to Jesus and this is how we get man-made laws. This is, this is how we get legalism. And, and so I just want to be really, really clear and, and really, really careful, I guess, on when I do and don't bind consciences. And I also want to be careful on when I do and don't offer opinions, because it's very easy for my opinions to be interpreted as right versus wrong, black and black and white. So this is this is kind of what informs my you know my my uh, addressing of all kinds of cultural issues, not just political ones. The questions we were just talking about: How should you educate your children? <laughs> there, there, there. I can think right now of examples of of churches or pastors where it is subtly or not subtly held in that church that if you there's really only one right way to educate your children and if if you don't do it this way you're doing it the wrong way and i think that isn't that's they would say well the people of god need application they they need they need help working out the implications of what this means and i would totally agree with that except i would say we need to be careful in our application that we don't we don't go beyond where scripture permits us to go as pastors, that we work that application out in a way that invites people to participate in in making up their own minds. So that's maybe a long-winded way of saying this is why we, we don't try to use the church platform or the pulpit in order to activate people politically or to get them all lined up and moving in the same direction, because Fellowship Denver is not a constituency that that I want. I don't want any politician to think I can go and use that church to get my uh, agenda over. In fact, I want them to experience that it's we're very frustrating to work with, and that they they can't get they they can't get their agenda over <laughs> you. And be, because that's just not my goal. My goal is to teach people the scriptures, to disciple them in a way that they're growing in their own understanding and their own faith. They can they can work these things out in in their mind. I'm about developing people and discipling people in that way. I'm, I'm not about uh, I'm not about the, turning the church to a political platform. So that that may be that's maybe my uh, my my feisty reason. I would <laughs> I would add one more thing to that, and this is not the only reason. Although I often get people often think my pastor critic friends, you know, my my pastor friends who would disagree with me would this is a maybe a criticism they would lob is. You've um, you've decided to to not do that because it's offensive to non Christians and you don't want to be offensive. Mm -hmm. And um, I I would say well I wouldn't I wouldn't put it in those terms because I'm very glad to be offensive. <laughs> um, there, there's just there I mean the Bible is just so the worldview of the Bible is so different than the secular world in which I live that like it's it's gonna be offensive. I'm gonna offend some people. And, when I preach this aforementioned um, sermon on sex, even as, try, as as hard as I try to be nice, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably just offend some people just because I'm saying what the Bible says. Um, but I also recognize there is a big cultural barrier between many people in our city and 
the gospel. And, and by cultural barrier, I, I mean they live close to the church geographically, physically, but the culture of Christianity feels so different from them and the culture of evangelicalism. And I've been on the other side of that cultural barrier, and I know what it feels like to be in a church and feel like these people are idiots, even even though they're not, even even though now now know they're not idiots. They they just believe the Bible. But I know it's like to be on the other side of that barrier. And so I want to be very careful that the things that I'm putting in that barrier space are essential to the gospel. I want that's the stuff I want them to stumble over. And to the extent I can not make them have to wrestle with all kinds of other secondary things, but just wrestle with the gospel stuff in that in that barrier. Um, that's that's what I that's what I want them to to experience. So there is a there is an evangelistic or a missiological reason to center on the gospel and and to not spend a lot of platform time talking a, as if we're all on the same page and we're all moving in the same direction. It just helps people that aren't there yet to be engaged and hopefully to to hear the gospel and to come to faith in Christ. So I I think in this world that we live in, where most people aren't Christians, we do need to be asking, how do we do evangelism as a church? We, we've got to be thinking about that. And I'm, at, at my heart, I'm, I'm very much an evangelist and, and a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering that, Hunter. I appreciate your perspective on it. And the example you gave um, from Paul saying that he was going to share his opinion, but also allow people to differ or to think about it. You use the term, have some space to mm -hmm. think about it, compare it to scripture, weigh it according to scripture. That example is so fitting. And because the intent of the gospel and the design of the church is that it will continue through time and across culture. And it's clear that Jesus taught that the nature of his kingdom is subversive and that it, uh, the way that it takes root in different cultures um, will confront mm -hmm. <laughs> various things in every culture that it enters and call people into a particular kind of life with Christ in this pattern of discipleship. And that brought to my mind a uh, uh, another book by a sociologist named James Davison Hunter. Um, it's called How to Change the World. And he says that the primary way that Christians should seek to, to our listeners question, uh, influence the state, but to bring about this kingdom ethic is by living as Christians day to day, participating in the life of the church through the means that we've talked about through evangelism and discipleship and living according to the ethics of the kingdom. Mm. And so I appreciate that that is your focus and your pastoral burden as well for our people and for the people in Denver who you do want to connect with and invite across that uh, potential barrier all right, we have one more question, and uh, that question is about a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> that question goes like this. The bumper sticker, God bless America, has always made me pause. The idea that God would bless a specific country may stem from God blessing Israel. Do you think it's right for us to pray that God bless one specific country over others? Hmm. Even in Israel's interactions with their neighbors, God does sometimes bless other nations besides Israel, and he blesses other people groups besides just Israel. He blesses Israel in a covenantal way, and, and the promises of God, the covenantal promises of God pass through Israel, but he blesses other nations in a more general way, you might say, which is with life, with prosperity— so I, I don't think it's wrong to pray that God would bless America. Uh, I, I don't mean that in a covenantal sense, as if we are God's covenant, as America is God's covenant people. That's For that, I want to pray, God bless the church. <laughs> we, we are God's covenant people in the church. But, but for God to pour general favor out on America, even to pray that he would bl spiritually bless our nation— in a way that many people in our nation would be awakened to his presence, to his reality. 
and would come to know him, I think is a is a good is a good prayer. The the one maybe check and maybe our listener is feeling this with the bumper sticker is like God bless America can mean any number of things to any number of people and unless you walk up to that car and knock on their window and go what what do you mean by God bless America how do you define God and how do you define bless and in what way do you perceive America as his covenant people or as his unless you just tap on their window and ask that you don't really know what they what they mean by it but as a as a general expression I'm I'm okay with it and um I, I think the precedent of praying for God to bless the people and the, who live around you is is a good is a good prayer. The questioner mentioned, I don't think it's right to pray that God would bless one specific country over others. Or actually asked, do you think it's right for us to pray that God bless one specific country over others? And I I don't think we have to be asked if we're praying God bless America. I don't think we have to be asking him to only bless America and not other countries in the same way that if you're praying for your children, you're not asking him not to bless other children. You're just praying for the kids, you know, and the, and you're praying for your children because they're your children and God's given you responsibility for them. And I, I look at that prayer in the same way. God's put me in this, in this nation. That wasn't my decision. That's his sovereign plan for my life. So I'm going to pray for this nation in which he's put me in. That doesn't preclude praying for, the nations. And so we should do both. Thank you, Hunter. Thanks for sharing your thoughts to those of you listening. Thanks for grilling me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sending in questions. We love hearing from you, whether you just want to send some feedback, uh, ask a further question to Hunter and I, a few of you have done that, sending in an, an, a follow-up email with some questions directly for us. We welcome those. We welcome your suggestions and questions that you'd like to hear us discuss on future episodes. I also want to mention that uh, in just a couple of weeks, we'll start recording episodes about the book Strange New World, based on the book Strange New World by Carl Truman. So we would love for you to join our book club, as it were. Grab a copy, read along, send us your thoughts and questions. We'll discuss the book, and then we will end that series of discussions with a Q&R episode as well. If you have those questions and suggestions, you can send them to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Special thanks to Adam Englin for our theme music, to Jesse Cowan, our producer, and to Judd Connell, who provides transcription for these episodes. 